Good morning. Today is Wednesday, the 14th of July, and this Wednesday follows the seventh Sunday after Pentecost, what is known as Proper Tin uh, for those who are looking for the lessons uh, year B. Also, it's known as today is known in France as the Fete Nationale, uh, also known as Bastille Day. And from the French Revolution, we get the famous words liberty, equality, and fraternity, uh, the hopes and aspirations of humanity uh, for freedom. Well, let's continue or begin our morning worship today from an opening sentence from Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises, declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hands are all the depths of the earth, and the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. O oh, come, let us adore him. Psalm 32 Blessed is the one whose unrighteousness, <clears throat> whose unrighteousness is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the one to whom the Lord imputes no sin and in whose spirit there is no guile. For while I held my tongue, my bones wasted away, I ceased not from groaning all the day long, for your hand was heavy upon, upon me day and night, and I was dried up and withered as in the drought of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin unto you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said I will confess my sins unto the Lord, and so you forgave the wickedness of my sin. For this reason shall all the godly make their prayer unto you at a time when you may be found. When the great flood waters rise, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall encompass me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go, and I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse and mule, which have no understanding, whose mouths must be held with bit and bridle, or else they will not come near you. Great troubles remain for the ungodly, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, O you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord, and be joyful, all who are true of heart. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our first lesson is from 1 Samuel chapter 5. When the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Uh, then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face down on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priest of Dagon and all who entered the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the people of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark of God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing it great panic, and he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought around to us the ark of God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel, and let it return to its own place, for it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. For behold, darkness covers the land, deep gloom enshrouds the peoples. But over you the Lord will rise, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will stream to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawning. Your gates will always be open by day or night, they will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction within your borders. You will call your walls salvation, and all your portals praise. The sun will no more be your light by day. By night you will not need the brightness of the moon. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Our second lesson is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 1 through 19. Paul continues as he writes, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or harp, 
do, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives a, an indistinct sound, how will, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager to, for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he might interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will, sp I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with the spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy, and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings that you pour out upon us. We ask that once again you and the Son would send the Holy Spirit into our midst to enkindle in us a passion of love for you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and a love for others. In your name and the name of Jesus, and a deep sense of compassion for those who have less than we have especially those who do not have the knowledge of the good news of Jesus Christ. Strengthen us all. Build up your church, your body, for the proclamation of your gospel. Amen. What wonderful lessons today. The psalmist talks of the forgiveness of sins, the mercy of the Lord, a warning to those who would reject God's offer of salvation and grace and mercy. And when we get to the first lesson today, we find something that is absolutely tragic and humorous at the same time. Uh, and the psalmist, uh, on occasion, uh, picks up on the same sort of theme and, and actually makes fun of people who make gods. All gods, that's a lowercase g, are handmade are man-made, are made by human beings. There is only one true God. That's known in Hebrew as Yahweh. We know as Christians the fullness of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, 
we affirm the Shema, if you will. Hear, O Israel, the one, the, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. We affirm that, one God, but three persons of this one God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And we see the revelation of these three persons. That's not something we invented. It's something we see contained in the Old and New Testaments. And so when we look at the Bible, this is the revelation of God, the full revelation. And so we accept it and we thank God for it. Uh, we thank God for him and his love for us, one God, three persons. And then we compare that, if you will, as the Bible compares it with man-made gods, such as Dagon, a statue. And we see that, as we talked yesterday, the the Hebrew people, the Israelites, treated the Ark of the Covenant as some type of talisman, as some type of magical instrument, uh, that we will bring it into battle and therefore we will win. Uh, not realizing, of course, the obvious, that God is the victor. God is the winner. God is the one who fights for his people. And God is not contained in any one object, even if it's dedicated to him as the Ark of the Covenant was. We have to be careful not to treat holy objects and confuse them almost as idols ourselves. And so God did not allow himself to be manipulated in such a way, and the Hebrew people fell to the Philistines. There was a mass slaughter, and the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God, was captured. And so it picks up today with a Ark being uh, transported by the Philistines to basically three different cities. And each city uh, is inflicted by God, as it says, the hand of the Lord was, was heavy upon them, because they had they had something in their hands, if you will, that they had no right to. But the humor of Dagon falling down and having to be put back up and falling down in a prostrate, prostrate, prostrate con, uh, um, position, which is a position of worship, uh, falling face down toward the Ark of the Lord. And so they put him back up in his place, and the next morning, now he's fallen down, but his head, he's decapitated and his hands are, or have been cut off and are off on the threshold. And so these people of Ashdod figured this out. We've got to get rid of this. And so you start thinking by the time you're the last city, as they did, they've sent the ark here to curse us, to kill us. Um, and so the decision is made, send it away from here, send it back. And that's where the story will pick up. But um, that whole idea of... Um, man-made gods and how foolish that is. Now let's reflect for a second on our lesson today uh, from Paul to the church in Corinth and to the church today. Uh, as you recall, Paul says, you all want spiritual gifts. Wonderful. But not all spiritual gifts work the same way. And so there's a good bit of discussion here by Paul about speaking in tongues. He doesn't speak against speaking in tongues. But he's saying this is prayer language. It's between the individual praying and God. It's a special language. And unless there's someone who's been given the, given the gift of interpretation of that language, it's sort of useless in the church. He's, he, he says the obvious. People don't even know when you've finished praying to say amen because they don't understand. And so if it's not interpreted for them, it's, you know, it's between you and God, it, but it doesn't build up the church. It builds up that person and his or her relationship with God, but it doesn't help the church proper. So uh, that sense of um, speaking in tongues uh, is uh, if without, without um, an interpretation. It doesn't build up. And so he really emphasizes, Paul does, on prophecy. But you see, prophecy, we often think of... Uh, prophecies as predictions of the future. And that's part of it, I guess you could say. But really, prophecy is declaring the word of the Lord. I'm trying to see where it, it exists here. Um, I might have uh, missed it, but uh, and I don't want to waste your time trying to find it. I can go by memory loosely. But, um, you know, he's, he's, he's basically saying that when you're, when you're giving a prophecy, uh, you are conveying the word of the Lord to the people, and therefore it builds up the church. Um, 
what here it is verse 3 the uh, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding okay so their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation you don't hear him saying and it tells them the future do you now Again, prophecies often do predict the future or they come true, which shouldn't surprise us because when they are from God and if they're about the future, then we should expect them to come through. God is, God is in charge. But in reality, for the most part, I should say, prophecy is about upbuilding, encouraging, and consoling the people who hear the prophecy. And in some ways, that sounds a bit like preaching, does it not? Uh, there's an old adage for the preacher that we are to, when we're preaching, we're to afflict the comfortable. In other words, challenge people um, from their comfort zones. And for those who are afflicted, those who are suffering, we need to comfort. So the saying goes, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Uh, that's a quick little summary, if you will, a part of uh, the admonition uh, to pastors, to, to preachers in particular. Of course, the real teaching is here, uh, partly in, in Paul's writing today, to provide uh, instruction, uh, to provide upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation, and to reveal God's word to the people. And often that does call people to repentance. It does call people to marshal around the good news. It calls us all uh, to Remember to keep the, the main thing, the main thing, the proclamation that Jesus is Lord. And so you've heard me say it before, that if the church doesn't use the language of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then there's something wrong with the language of the church. Now, we may all have our preferences. There are some people who like to pray to the Father. That's okay. There are some people who like to pray to Jesus. That's okay. There's some people who like to pray particularly to the Holy Spirit. That's okay. But it all has to be under the one God head, uh, the one God, three persons. <clears throat> but if we are only talk about God, only talk about God, only talk about God, in quotes, then eventually someone might ask, which God are you talking about? Where's Jesus in that? And we've talked about this before, that there's a huge move uh, amongst even Christians to don't speak about the Son and don't talk about the Holy Spirit and just talk about God in public and even in the church. The problem is, is when you talk about God in that way, with a limitation imposed, we're not really talking about God anymore, are we? We're talking about this elusive God that can be anything. <clears throat> we need to be careful about that. Never, never deny the Son. Never deny the Father. Never deny the Holy Spirit. And so we might have preferences, but those preferences should not overrule. And that's why you'll see in a liturgical church such as ours, practically every prayer ends with a Trinitarian statement. We'll either addressing the Father or the Son. Uh, mostly, I'm. There may be a prayer or two directly to the Holy Spirit, but, but in any event, however it's directed, it always, uh, most of the time, I, I say always, that's a bit broad, isn't it? But I can't think of an exception, let me put it that way, where there's a statement at the end of that prayer that says something to the effect of one God, and then it names the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or if it's praying to God, then it will say something, God the Father, then it will say, and your Son, and the Holy Spirit. So you'll see there's a Trinitarian formula. And that helps keep us in check. It helps us remind, be reminded that even though we may have preferences of how we pray, that we always pray in a Trinitarian uh, understanding, one God, three persons. We even begin our service that way. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's important. Um, and it's important here that we keep the main thing the main thing. And that means it is appropriate to seek spiritual gifts. As I've mentioned, God provides those abundantly to build up the church. And so that's ultimately what we should pray for is, Lord, use me to build up your body, the, the church, to build up 
the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And so your talents, your gifts, your mind, your intellect, your background, your studies, your work, all of that, your passions, as long as they're godly passions, they're, they're available to be used to the building up of the church. And so this is a continuation of that thought. And so, you know, Paul is very clear. I'd, I'd rather speak, you know, uh, just a few words of, in tongues in the church if I could speak so many more in prophecy in actually building up the church. Yeah, there it is. I'd rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Again, it's not against praying in tongues. It's about the proper use. And all of our gifts should be used for what? To build up the body of Christ. And part of that building up the body of Christ, don't forget, is the proclamation of the good news. The body is always bringing in new members and therefore the Great Commission. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The words of Christ. Let's continue now with the Apostles' Creed. And remember I mentioned yesterday, and you might want to think about it also again today, how the Creed could in many ways be uh, an outline of the Bible, beginning with creation and ending uh, with the uh, new Israel, if you will, uh, that resurrection, re resurrected body with Christ coming again and life everlasting in the kingdom. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us, and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness, and let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that we may receive what we ask, teach us by your Holy Spirit, to ask only those things that are pleasing to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the same, and the same Spirit lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Defend us by your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor run into any danger, and that, guided by your Spirit, we may do what is righteous in your sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone works great marvels, send down upon our clergy and the congregations committed to their charge the life-giving Spirit of your grace. Shower them with the continual dew of your blessing, and ignite in them a zealous love of your gospel, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, we move into our prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings as the Holy Spirit places in our minds and upon our hearts as we reflect on our own individual needs, 
uh, concerns of our family, including our church family, universal and local. And of course, uh, prayers, if you would, for those who do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that he would equip us to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and for those who have walked away, that uh, again, he would equip us, and the Holy Spirit would equip us in such a way to, to help encourage um, those who have left the faith to come back into the faith in Jesus Christ. And, um, and, and that leads me to one other uh, odd comment, or maybe a comment before we enter into prayer. Uh, you may ask, well, why are you mentioning Bastille Day <clears throat> today? Um, France was a heavily Roman Catholic uh, country, and it remains for those who practice uh, a the faith a heavily Roman Catholic country. But there is a saying that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And on the 14th of July, Bastille Day, uh, this prison, Bastille, was um, <clears throat> the people rose up, attacked it, and freed seven prisoners. And it is, in a sense, is the spark, sort of our, the equivalent of, somewhat like ours, where the, the Boston Tea Party is the spark of the American Revolution. This is the spark of the French Revolution. And revolutions are scary. And they tend to be very, uh, and so are civil wars for that matter. The England has gone through a civil war. They beheaded their king, and eventually they persuaded, uh, persuaded uh, Charles II, the son of the monarch, to come back. And then we moved very quickly from an absolute monarch, Charles I, uh, to one who was not an absolute monarch, Charles II, and to the monarchy as it is developed today in England. The United States, of course, in our Declaration of Independence, addressed George III and said, thank you very much, but we're no longer interested in a monarchy. We'll do things uh, under, under, uh, under God uh, ourselves. And the French uh, had the same thing. There were, in the French system, you check out the history, there were three estates. The first estate was the church, the second estate was the monarchy, the third estate was the people. And unfortunately, what often happens with the church is the church aligns itself with the powers that be, whether it be monarchy or dictator. And therefore, when people are oppressed, it's hard to distinguish the oppression from the monarchy, the dictator, or the church. Because when the church is so co-opted, it becomes indistinguishable. And the church suffered greatly um, in the French Revolution. But I have to say, do we blame the people for that? Or does, does the church need to look at what happens when the church is tied so closely to a national identity, such as monarchy or the state, in such a way that it becomes indistinguishable? And therefore, when tyranny occurs by the state, the church, in some ways, gets its just deserts. Uh, I think of the church in uh, the, that stands out very closely. There's a church in, in Germany which is decorated with all types of Nazi um, memorabilia, things that are on the altar, around the pulpit, all of this stuff. It, it, it was a church that was fully co-opted uh, by Nazism and therefore, in my opinion, ceased to be a church because the church is allegiant to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not to any government. And so we all strive for liberty, equality, fraternity. These are foundational statements of the French Revolution. You could say they were foundational statements in the sense of the American Revolution. That whole idea, is, you know, France is our oldest ally. That whole idea of um, human beings ruled under God. <clears throat> and um, it's worth remembering I guess I should say as we wrap up this little lecture, uh, it's worth remembering that uh, we in the church bear a great deal of responsibility, how we act and how we behave and how we align ourselves with the powers that be. And, uh, and then we need to always be aligned first and foremost under God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in order to avoid 
getting mislabeled. And I would also say the church in the past has made mistakes of going after the, the powerful people, the kings, the monarchs, instead of converting the people and serving the people. Jesus went to who? He went to the powerless and offered them the power of God. Not in the sense of now all-powerful, almighty God, but the power of God in forgiveness, restoration, and being sons, daughters, heirs of the Father. And so that's the true strength of the church, is going to the weak and offering those who are really oppressed, often by the present governments, true freedom in Christ. So I invite your prayers today for those around the world uh, who are st seeking liberty, equality, fraternity, a, a sense of brotherhood, sisterhood, and may I add, all under God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now let us, let us join together and pray. We lift up the people of Myanmar, our Christian friends there, especially as they are seeking freedom. Continue to ask your prayers for those that we are aware of that we need to continue to offer prayers for and those that you may know individually and you're welcome to share those with us or just simply continue to lift those prayers up directly to the Lord. Amen. Please join with me now in the general thanksgiving for all the wonderful gifts that God gives us and has given us over the years and continues to give us through His Son and through the Holy Spirit and by His very nature, being a loving, just, and merciful God. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, my friends, I wish you all a wonderful Wednesday. Our friends in France, happy Bastille Day. And for all of us, let us encourage each and every one of us to seek the liberties, the equalities, and the fraternity that is offered under God you will notice in many ways those could be uh, Christian attributes. Um, liberty under God, equality under God, fraternity under God. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow for morning prayer. And also I ask your prayers on Wednesday for our Bible study at Holy Comforter tonight at 6.30 to 7.30 as we open up God's Word and seek um, 
to learn more about God, his plans for us, and the great gifts that he has given us through his word. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.